This is One on One. What is the role of Judaism as a religion? Here in the studio to explore that and other larger questions about religion and society are two experts on the subject. First, our friend Stephen Ollendorf, founder of the Ollendorf Center, and Rabbi Jack Bemperad, who joins us uh, for the first of three very important conversations we'll be have, you know, having with the uh, help and support of the Ollendorf Center. Stephen, put in context for us. I mean, we started this conversation um, in a program you did with us in our Lincoln Center our WNET Lincoln Center right. studio. First of all, the Ollendorf Center, put it in context, what is it? The Ollendorf Center was designed to preserve Judaism because we feel it's in crisis. And if you look at the empirical numbers, both as religion within the other context of major religions and in the evidence within its own context, for example, there are about a 1 billion, 100 million Catholics. There are about 1 billion, 400 million Muslims. There are less than 14 million Jews in the world, of which approximately 6 million are in Israel and approximately 5.4 million are in America. Before World War II, we had 5 million Jews in America. There was an immigration of 1.2 million Jews in America. Now we have less than those two sums together. We have an intermarriage rate of most probably exceeding 50%. We have a non-affiliation of people who consider themselves Jews in America who are not affiliated with any religious organization or congregation. So when you take all of those numbers together, Judaism as a religion is under severe stress. A crisis? It's a crisis in numbers as a religion. And why that's so critical is because unlike Israel, which is a Jewish, has all the Jewish institutions, if people are not supporting Judaism as a religion, if they're not supporting the synagogues, if they're not supporting those institutions, they will no longer exist, and so there won't be any home for Judaism as a religion, and therefore they won't be able to support rabbis, and I think Jack will go into, Rabbi Bempar will go into to it later. So the, our whole goal at the Ollendorf Center. At the Ollendorf Center, with the cooperation of Rabbi Bemperad, is to provide a meaningful spiritual experience for Jewish people in modern America today. And the extra goal, which I think I mentioned in your last program, is Rabbi Bemperad and I both are Holocaust refugees, and we are dedicated with all our might not to have Hitler win the war by as a result of ignorance, indifference, and uh, or lack of knowledge. And so that's why we are undertaking what we're doing. Rabbi, I'm sure there are a lot of reasons for the dynamics that uh, the situation, the crisis, as Stephen pointed out. But I'm gonna just jump right into it. Sure. Stephen mentioned the Holocaust. For many Jews, people um, born Jewish, who do not practice the faith, is it fair to say that for a significant number of them, they say, you ha how could I believe and practice Judaism in given the Holocaust. Is that for many You mean in terms of the problem of evil? How could why, there why, why have Jews have suffered so much? Yes. Is well, that too simplistic an explanation? I'm sure there are many other explanations, but give, particularly given your experience, your family's experience. Well, you know, the interesting thing is that there are many people who uh, have questioned, is there a God, is there a God, is God just? Why is there so much evil in the world? There's no question that that is uh, predominantly of concern, and Jews have addressed themselves to that question. But the reality is that it's only a minority of Jews that actually say, I'm giving up Judaism because of the Holocaust or because Jews have suffered so much. I don't believe that. What are the other reasons, then? Because I it's a crisis. I think the real issue the is that they are actually not clear that Judaism speaks to them, that it's credible, that it's authentic, that it's legitimate, that it really corresponds with the way they live their life or the things they believe. And so the real question, it seems to me, is to try to explain Judaism on a level that makes sense to them, where they can say, yes, it's clear, it's true, this is what I believe, this is why I believe it, and this is how I can practice it. Is that where the 10 principles of yes. Judaism until come in? We, right, until we can clarify for people 
what really is it that's unique and central and basic about Judaism and why it's compelling to you as a Jew? That becomes the question. Now, in the past, that really wasn't necessary. Most people said, well, all you have to do is learn how to be Jewish. Learn how to, how to, be, how Jewish. to be Jewish. What does that mean? Words, well, how to, read, how to read Hebrew, how to celebrate the holidays, how to practice Judaism. But the question of why be Jewish was hardly ever asked. Today, you have to ask the question, why should anyone want to be Jewish? That's the deeper question. That's a much more profound question. And here, for that, you need a rationale. You have to say, well, one of the reasons is because it teaches ethical principles, rational principles, spiritual principles that speak to you. And you can say, yes, that's exactly what I believe. And when for they example. see that the teachings of Judaism is what, for example, uh, one of the things that I think divides the religions is that there are a number of religions that seek certainty. In other words, I want certainty. Judaism isn't like that. It's not a creedal religion. It doesn't have dogmas. What Judaism says, I want understanding. I want to be able to understand myself in the, in the scheme of things. I want to understand how I fit into the world. I want to see that I'm more than flesh and bones, that I have some kind of a spiritual, ethical nature mm. that connects me to something that transcends me. I have to ask questions of what am I here? What is the purpose of my existence? And those are questions that a spiritual, rational, ethical Judaism can address. Stephen, as I listen to the rabbi, I ask myself, first of all, I'm fascinated by what you're saying. And by the way, uh, if you're just joining us, we'll be doing a series of conversations with the rabbi, exploring not just the question of Judaism and, as a religion and why it's in crisis and what is being done, but also the larger question of also um, why be religious at all for right. other faiths as yeah. well? Right. Why is that larger question important to the Ollendorf Center? The, the reason is the reason I always was Jewish was because of the history of the Holocaust, and I felt I felt an obligation that, as I said, I didn't want Hitler to win the war. However, even and I'm not ritually oriented. But at the end of the day, I do believe in something greater than myself, a spirit greater than myself. And what we try to develop with the Ten Principles is not only a spirit. The Ten Principles of Judaism. Judaism. It has to pass certain tests. One of it is spirituality, but it has to be rational. In other words, can you get into a debate and defend that principle on its rationality in today's modern life? Can you say, this makes sense with knowing everything we know about technology? knowing everything we know about science, knowing everything that happened in the world, do these principles make sense? Now, for example, the first principle, and I don't want to get that one, Zach, is in each of us is the spark of the divine. Say that again. In each of us yeah, there is is, is, is... is the spark of the divine. So that establishes that each one is a unique individual, that he has an obligation, and there's a battle between him, between good and evil, and it's up for him to how he assesses that battle. And so it is an obligation imposed upon that person, knowing that there's something beyond just cold material facts, but there is this divine spirit with you, and how are you going to deal with it? So that brings a uniqueness to a person. I think most people do believe there's something beyond themselves. Now, how do you deal with it in a rational mm. way? How do you deal with it in so a practical it has, way? That it has a meaning in your life, not that you have to go through 15,000 meaning, meaningless rituals. If you go to a ritual, why is that ritual there? Does it make sense in leading you to a more moralistic life, a more satisfying life, and having you fulfill your potential? By the way, we'll actually, in future programs, the rabbi go through the principle, ten principles. Add, add a little yeah. bit more to what Stephen's saying about this first principle. Well, I think that you cannot believe that a human being is strictly flesh and bones and strictly matter in motion. That a human being is addressed by a uh, call to conscience, concerned about the good, the true, the beautiful, the holy. You can't take these elements away from being a human being. And to the extent that one ask, asks oneself, well, what is really truth? What does it mean to lead a good life? How do I really make sense of my life so that it, I fit into the universe and I can justify my existence by saying I'm doing something that makes sense and that really is a contribution to mankind and to the common good and to humanity, you really have to see that you're more than just a biological, psychological, physical entity. Rabbi, how do most who are Jewish but not practicing Judaism as a religion, when you talk to them, when you get that opportunity, how do most of them respond 
to what you're saying right now? I think that those people would say, oh, you know, I never thought about that. It never occurred to me, for example, that this universe is orderly, that it has a, a, a sense of organization, of patterns, that you can't simply say it's a matter in motion or blind chance. And once I start asking the question, well, if there is an order to nature, if there is some element of creation, if there is some supreme being that somehow created the world and organized the world and puts us in the world and gives us a task in this world, then all of a sudden they begin to think of it differently. There's it's almost like there's here. a new center of reference. I'm sorry for interrupting. There's an opportunity here. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So now, once you open that opportunity up, then the question comes, okay, now what's going to fill the gap? I, mm. Okay, I need something more than just worrying about whether I have enough food or whether I have enough fun. I now know that I have to devote, be devoted, as Steve says, to something greater. I have to feel part of something greater. So in that spirit, Stephen, let me ask you, in the limited time we have left, what is your hope in terms of what we achieve in this series of conversations with the rabbi, um, not just for those who happen to be Jewish and practicing or not practicing Judaism as a religion, but for everyone else? I think there's a great change going on, demonstrated by the election of the new pope. But I think people are looking to religion for spiritual guidance, for moral guidance, for things that make sense. And to me, it has to make sense. It has to be rational. And I also think innateness, there are certain characteristics of, and they didn't get there because we put them there. We didn't control it. If I, I'll just give you a very quick story. My, my little son, grandson Graham, had a little assignment to do, and he couldn't finish it. He only, was only four years old, and my son finished it for him. And my grandson, when he handed it to the teacher, said, I didn't do this assignment. My father did it. And it's that sense of ethics that he had innate in him. And if he was tempted one way or another, I think the role of religion is which way do you go, and that it's within your power, and give us the guidance to do the right moral choices. It's almost like calling a person back to a part of themselves that they weren't even aware of. Yeah. Stephen, Rabbi, uh, we're off to a very meaningful start. There's a long way to go. Uh, I want to thank you for helping you. us, and I look forward to those future conversations, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Stephen. Stay with us. We're right back right after this. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One has been provided by the Allendorf Center, Meridian Health, AT&T, New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Group, the law firm of Gibbons PC, Cohn Resnick, and by TD Bank. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. This program has been made possible in part by New Jersey Institute of Technology.